So the second last session of the day. Hello. And here we're going to be deep diving into the exciting world of music artist development from Asia and to the world. And really in this session, we're going to be looking at, you know, how in the dynamic shift in the industry, digital innovation, or what is the success stories of artist development? How do we use um, technology platforms efficiently? How do we harness that? Um, and before I kick it off, I'm going to have a quick round of introductions. So a lot of the audience here would love to hear more about your background. So tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you're based, what do you do for the, the company? Shall I start? Okay. First off, I don't normally sound like this. I've just been having too much fun in Singapore, so, so thank you. Um, so I'm Megan West. I lead the Global Label Partnerships team for Meta. Um, I'm based out of New York, and so flew 18 hours to get here, which was awesome, and I've been having a great time. My team is responsible for working with thousands of record labels around the world. We work with the biggest labels, like Universal, as well as independent labels, um, as they bring their music into Meta's ecosystem. So that's Facebook, that's Instagram, that's Oculus and Messenger. And we spend a lot of time working with a lot of people in this room and their colleagues, um, helping them to harness the power of our platforms to reach new audiences and um, help them you know, find new fans and help people discover new music. Hi, I'm Calvin. This is my 18th year in Music Matters, uh, <laughs> after Jasper. Uh, well, we started it together. So uh, I, I started my music career in the 80s, so I'm not young anymore. Uh, artist development is my alarm clock. It wakes me up in the morning, sometimes late at night. So uh, I'm very privileged in my career that uh, I have helped some uh, Western artists to be very popular in Southeast Asia. Uh, some of them are not even popular in their own countries. Um, so, and I have helped some local artists become very popular in their own countries. And I have some, made some local artists very popular in outside of their own countries, but within the region. The only thing I haven't done is make a local artist very popular globally. So hopefully out of this uh, panel, I can find a formula with my two esteemed guests here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Ed Shapiro and uh, I'm a partner at Reed Smith. Uh, we're a, a law firm of about 1,800 lawyers. We've got four offices here in Asia, in Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore, and um, Hong Kong. But I'm based in New York. Um, and what I basically do and what I've done for the last 30 years is I represent artists and content creators. So it's mostly artists, um, producers, songwriters, and I try to extract as much value from people like Calvin as I can. Awesome. So um, the first thing that I want to just kick us off is really to have everyone share a bit of the observations with artist development. Where are artists getting it right? And where are some of the missed opportunities that you've seen from where you come from? So Megan, you have a front row seat from Meta. Um, so let's start with you first. Sure, so you know, one of the things that we see being incredibly successful, and this is for big artists as well as small, small artists, and some of you may have heard this yesterday at some of the great presentations that folks on our team did. It's all about consistency. When you think about showing up in the social space, whether you're in a country that's Facebook first or Instagram first, um, it's about being present. And it's also about authenticity and representing yourself you know, in a way that you feel comfortable with. So jumping on a trend that you don't actually feel like it speaks to who you are doesn't work because people will understand that you don't feel comfortable. And we also think a lot about things like unconnected distribution. And so what we see being really successful for artists, and again, of all sizes and across genres, this isn't specific to K-pop or hip hop or anything like that. It's about you know using the tools that you have. And so a great one of those is Reels and posting consistently because it enables you to reach audiences that you don't normally have. 
And so really thinking about ways that you can be posting you know, on a regular basis, whether that's jumping on a trend, whether that's using your own music to express yourself, collaborating with other artists. Um, and it helps you reach new people in different ways. And I can talk for hours about examples and I'm sure we'll get into some of that. But I would say the first thing is being always, always a little bit on and then being authentic to who you are. Since we're on social media, I think um, the, the explosion of social media and global digital platforms has made the world flatter. And uh, artists are no longer need to ask permission from whatever countries to release their CDs. You can have a song uploaded and you can reach the world. However, uh, as we have been listening the last few days, um, one of the most important things is in why an artist become an artist is to have fans. Otherwise, you're really literally singing a shower to yourself, right? So, so to have a lot of fans and the keyword that's been used uh, was super fans, you know. Um, developing fans is becoming a, a, a race almost, but. Um, I think the biggest observation was like, as much as I want my artist to be a global superstar, it needs to start at home. It needs to be a global, it needs to be a superstar at home, wherever the artist may be, and build from there. You know, we have seen the explosion of uh, reggaeton, but it starts from Latin America. You know, K pop, it starts in Korea went all over Asia, and then finally with the help of uh, the digital platforms, you know, make a big push to America and the rest of the world. So I, I think having that mindset of pacing, uh, developing a fan base layer after layer and unearth new fans along the way. And, and also furthermore, another point was that like, you know, people are now, are now having multiple races all over the world. We talk about diaspora of Vietnamese in America or, 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 or Filipinos in America or Asian community in general is growing everywhere. So it's, it's very interesting because those diaspora also help spread the culture within those countries as well. And, and why I think this is the most exciting period for Asians because we have a lot of Asians everywhere. So, uh, and, and K-pop has shown it, uh, but it's also important to show the uniqueness of your own culture uh, to be able to have that capability of traveling to various uh, boundaries around the world. And, and, and I'm excited uh, uh, to be part of it right now. There's nothing left to say. I mean. Um, I know everything Megan and Calvin said, I, I second, we were talking about it before, which is, for me, it's, um, it's always about when I meet someone new, you know, we can talk about the outliers, but the outliers don't count because they're going to succeed no matter who they are. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, BTS or Rihanna, or, these people are succeeding no matter what. But the young new artists, the mid-level artists, it's like, they must want it more than I want it. You know, like when I meet a new artist and I feel like I want their career more than they do, it's like we're dead on arrival. Um, and I think the fundamentals haven't changed. You know, it used to be, it's all about the song. And I, there was someone here last year that was stressing that so much and I was like cringing. Because it is about the song. But the game today is also, it's, so it's quality but it's also quantity, but in quantity in a different way. It used to be like I would tell my three friends and they would tell their three friends and we would grow that. But now you have the ability to, to tell a lot more friends. And if you don't do it, you're so behind the eight ball. And I see it across the board with so many artists that I work with that like, it's very, very clear the ones who have the teams around them, support from you know, the UMGs of the world and their management teams. And, their lawyers, hopefully, and, um, and the ones who think they're basically, they're living in a fiction, which is, well, social media will do it for me. And that hasn't changed. The, the fundamentals still haven't changed. So I think that's like the, the positive side and, and again, the downside. 
Thanks for that. And so talking about social media, and obviously Meta is such a big platform for a lot of artists. Megan, you said about consistency being a key, and Kelvin as well, saying about building that fan base. You know, I do hear that a lot of artists do struggle about consistency and trying to think more strategically beyond the release cycle. Have you seen artists successfully do that? And do you have any advice who, with, for artists or labels that struggle in that area? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, you know, one of the things when you think about Facebook and Instagram is, is to Ed's point, you know, you've got your friends. This is about building a bigger community, right? And people use those platforms to not just communicate with their friends and family, but to connect more broadly. And when we think about that and we think about opportunities to build fan bases, you know, I talked about Reels before, which is our short form video pl platform. Um, you know, when you look at Reels content, there are over 200 million views of Reels every day. That is a lot of people looking at content. And over 2 billion Reels are shared every day. That is a lot of people liking something enough, whether it's a hamster eating spaghetti or a baby or an artist, sharing it with somebody else. And those are all opportunities for your content to get in front of someone new. And so when we think about that and think about sort of consistency in building that community, some of the things we've seen, um, and again, you know, I can, I can talk artists from, about artists from all over, but um, I'll call, call that one that's top of mind. Um, our team worked closely with Benson Boone and his team out of Australia, and he started posting reels consistently. And some of them were performance reels, some of them were him going about his day, having his own life experience because he felt comfortable with that. But because he was, excuse me, posting them consistently, using his own music as well, which is great, and it's not necessarily about the song, but it's about the music soundtracking the moment. That unconnected distribution I mentioned, which means it doesn't just go to the people that follow you, it goes to people that like similar things to you or other people that might be qualified audiences. It enabled him to increase his followership by over a thousand percent. And those followers then are people that not just didn't just see the reel and went on to something else. They thought it was interesting enough to go figure out who he was and then follow him because they want more updates. And then that enabled him when he was actually looking to tour outside of his home country to have qualified fans that were there. And so, you know, it's that idea of being able to take something that, you know, I think for every artist it's different. Not everybody feels comfortable being up in front of the screen. But as I said before, finding the thing that feels authentic to you and then finding ways to put your music into that to help people discover. Um, we talked a little bit yesterday about a great tool we launched recently called Collab which is the ability to create reels with somebody else and then build an audience from there. Um, we just had um, an hyphen um, and a Latin artist called Camilo, both giant artists in their own right, but they were at Summer Sonic not very long ago. And they actually met for the first time backstage and they created a reel together. And it was not using either one of their songs, but they jumped on a trend of another track, a, a, I hate to say classic because it's a track from the 90s, but. I guess that's classic now. Um, but they jumped on a trend together and they posted it and fans from, and Hyphen are commenting on it, fans from Camila are commenting on it. And some of those fans that may connect between the two of them were saying, this is the collaboration I never knew I needed. Um, and Camilo even messaged one of my team members saying, I think we need to actually do a collab. That was amazing. Like maybe we need to figure something out. But there are those moments where again, it doesn't also have to just be about, to Ed's point, you as an island, it's finding the people around you, it's finding the community and bringing that back in and then using it to create create more audience. Cool. And Kelvin, you mentioned the word super fans. As, as Megan talks about building a community, there are fans and there are super fans. From your perspective, what is that secret sauce in how artists and labels built that stickiness with fan base? Uh, my competitors are here, so I can't <laughs> tell them my secret. How can you just, give away secret little, sauce? Just from, a little secret sauce. Come on. I think echoing on... on on the, the part of like content, right? So I, I think it's important, like, you know, everybody's talking about always on, uh, because, you know, nowadays it's not, to build the super fans, a little bit of a secret sauce. Um, to build super fans, you need to engage with your fans on a regular basis. So uh, that is very difficult if an artist has been doing what they were doing before. It's like, why do I have to change what I always do before and blah, blah, blah. So we are constantly battling with that in terms of educating our artists 
to become relevant to today's world and you know, I mean, there's things like algorithm. You, you go and tell the artist, algorithm is important. They're like, what are you talking about, right? Where's my money? So, so I think all this is a challenge, uh, but also an opportunity uh, that we need to make artists understand the, the technological changes, how the world evolves, and how important is content, when to post it, what to post, you know, you don't have to do dancing videos all the time. So, you know, so all, all these are education, and I think that's really, really important for artists to continue to be relevant today. Uh, and, and that takes a lot, even for the record label, artist management company, the whole ecosystem, to change with that pace of change that is going around the, the, the industry right now. And Ed, do you have any comments on that secret sauce to building super fans? Yeah, you hire me and I'll tell you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, the secret sauce. I mean, you do have to do those dance things on TikTok if you're Anita and you crush it and you invite your you know, gazillion fans to kind of like participate. Um, but I think what's really interesting is, yes, you have to engage your audience, but there's so many different ways of engaging your audience. Like a minute ago it was, come to my show, please listen to my music. I, I mean, there was, it was less than a handful. And today I'm seeing clients that are doing really innovative things. You know, we've got clients who are putting out, intentionally putting out their tracks and saying, what do you think about this one to their fans? Like, do you like this one? Should I finish it? It's obviously finished, but you know, do you like it? And it's like testing the market. And you know, she, when she would, one person I'm thinking of would get crazy feedback. It's like she feels confident about it, but it's like, oh, that's that's green light. Let's run with that. And um, there's someone else who put out a track with intentionally left a verse out. And uh, and I don't know if you know who I'm referring to, Megan, but there's. There's this artist who's put out, he likes to eat while he sings. Um, and um, anyway, he put out a, a track with a verse and invited people to come on. And it was like a contest to like, on Instagram to like drop their verse in. And the, the quality of the verses was unbelievable. But it just generated, I think, people who probably didn't watch him to go, well, this is dope. and um, and. Yes, it created interest in that person who, was, who wasn't on anyone's map before, but it also increased the artist, like, I think the passion about that artist, like, wow, this, this artist is reaching out to, like, just random fans on Instagram. You create, you create that connection as well with the audience. Yeah, so I hear the word authenticity creating that connection with the audience. And now we're talking a lot about exporting Asian artists onto a global platform, opening up to a diverse global audience and fan base that they might not have very broad cultural nuance or insight into engaging them. Do you see that conversation change for an Asian artist wanting to be able to speak to a global fan base that is outside of their local territory? And have artists done that well? Well, I mean, one of the things that our team talks a lot about is, is, and I feel like I've heard this word all over this week, is, is global. So it's like that idea of you know, taking what is happening locally and how do you expand it out. And, and we talk a lot about that um, internally as well. But I mean, the thing is for us, you know, while we may be talking to Calvin's teams here, our platforms are global. When you put something up, it's going to go everywhere, or it has the potential to go everywhere, right? And so, you know, I think that's part of the beauty of it is that there is no, oh, I'm putting this up and it's only going to be seen by people in my country. Um, but again, there's ways that you can tap into the zeitgeist of what's happening. And, you know, to Ed's point, it, whether it's a dance challenge or not, um, I'm probably, like, I think probably some of those submissions on Instagram came from all over the world. And not because, again, those fans knew anything about that artist, but because they saw it show up in their recommendations as like, what is this thing that this guy did? Oh, it's from this challenge. I want to get on that moment. But that's the beauty of it. 
And the things that we're also seeing too, and I, um, I actually had the opportunity to talk to a couple of artists last night, is also because it's global, you know, you find a fan and you're able to connect with them or you get them to sort of enjoy your music, they follow you. You then are also building a virtual street team in many ways. Um, because somebody's finding your music not because they live in the country that you're in, but because it's great music or they saw it on a video and they thought it was really interesting, so they followed you. Now you have people you can reach out to and say, hey, I'm touring here, or I'm going, I'm thinking about this, or hey, fans, I'm, you know, I'm, I might have the opportunity to go to, I don't know, South by Southwest in Austin or in Australia. Should I come? What else should I do? Tell me about your city. And getting them to then advocate and say, oh, you're coming to play? I'm gonna bring five of my friends with, with me to your show, right? And so it's using that as a way to, again, distribute out to an audience that isn't just where you are. Um, and then I think with that too, as we talked about before, you know, there is some content that people create that is very regional and very specific, but that doesn't mean that there's not an audience everywhere else, because even to Calvin's point earlier with the diaspora, there are fans that connect culturally to whatever trend you're jumping on all over the world, and this is just a mechanism to get in front of them. You know, it's, it's no longer that you need to have a publicist and a relationship with 18 different people to reach your fan, which is what it was like when I started. The artists never got to speak to their fans except for at a show. And now you, you can post right now and it'll be in front of fans in 30 seconds. I agree and I also partly disagree. And uh, largely because if, as a marketeer, uh, it's great, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, Meta, able to get my artists to reach the world. As a marketeer, when you write a marketing plan, you don't put the target audience, the world. Yeah. So, because you want to, but you, you do not have that kind of money to reach mm -hmm. to that global audience. So, you again, going back to what I start, spoke about at the beginning, you need to start somewhere mm -hmm. with the biggest chance of success. So, you know, if and going back to the Asian artists going global, it really has to see where the artist is coming from. There is, we cannot say Chinese is the same as uh, Indonesian, for example, you know? So for me, I will always say, go local, then find the next audience. It's like a peeling the onion, right? It's like layer by layer. So if I'm an Indonesian artist, I want to make sure I get my Malaysian market because they speak the same Bahasa language. Singapore has a large Bahasa Muslim population as well. So then you start to create more opportunities because at the end of the day, while I love a viral track that can go global and possibly a short career from there, I prefer long-term artist development that has a long-lasting career. Because, again, going back to my point, this is not a hobby, this is a job, this is a career for the singers that we are trying to create, at least from universal standpoint. And we want to make sure that they have a foundation that is strong enough to allow more investment to get to a bigger market and a bigger market. You know, we have Zach Tabutlo, right? The first step, trust me, if you talk to the artists, they want to rule the world, they want to do this and that. But then I said, Zach, you're gonna, you're gonna give me number one song first. And then it's like, Calvin, I have three number one songs, what's next? So okay, 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 I'll get you Thailand, right? And now it's like, oh, now Thailand is platinum, so what are you gonna do? So, but it's great, but it's, it's a peeling the onion, you know? And now I'm, you know, the artist is, making a good living, he's motivated, he wants to go to see more countries, and you know, he's touring America, obviously to Filipino diaspora, but you have spillover because yeah. these people have Facebook, there's like, yeah. I was in Zach Tabulo concert, it's like, who the hell is this Zach Tabulo, yeah. right? So, so but, I agree on that part, okay? But I, but I, I get it, it's you have, to, you have certain resources that you need to focus. Exactly. And then the additional benefit is, while you're focusing in those areas, that content's out there globally, that there can be fans in the US finding it, right? right? Right. Even BTS, I, yeah. I was privileged enough to be in one of the DSP's convention. Uh, they invited me and, and I was speaking to some quite a big shot and he was saying, next year, we will make BTS a big deal in America. I was like, shit, I wish it was my artist. But anyway, uh, he ended up becoming our, one of our distribution artists. 
And I was like, wow, that's brave, you know? Because BTS, I mean, K-pop was there, but it was never a mainstream act. Sometimes you need all these things to work together. And then when you see them actually doing it, and then the momentum, and, and now we know what happened, it's, it's amazing. But, you know, sometimes you've got to wait for that perfect storm, you know? That, that magic moment to arrive. And, and, and all that will only work if you get the fundamentals going. You, you need to make the economics going. Otherwise, it's a dream, you know? I mean, I love to dream, but I have to make the artist dream become a reality. So, and that's when it all becomes another discussion. So, Sorry, Calvin, sir. you gotta, that's great. That's all wonderful. But you gotta talk to the home, the home base in, in Los Angeles and New York and tell them to stop doing what they're doing. <laughs> um, let me tell you why. My, my job is to like maximize value for my clients, and that's today's day and age. The clients want the most amount of money, the most control, with the least obligation to the label, right? Keep the obligations for delivering tracks to a minimum so that they can be free fairly soon and get as much money as we can get. No 360 rights retain all of those things. And those are all wonderful things. Trust me, I represent artists. Um, but you have labels that are chasing market share, right? And so what do they do? They go to TikTok. They check out what's the hottest track, not the hardest art, hottest artist. They're not chasing the artist, but a lot of labels are chasing the tracks, the singles that are happening right now. The majority of those artists are, there is no second track, right? So there is a, a, a bit of a paradox, right? Yes, artist development is super important, and labels, in, in many instances, are chasing that single that's happening right now, and they're paying an insane amount of money to get that for that market share, but they're not actually investing in the artist, and it, at the end of the day, the artist is not really, besides putting some money in their pocket, they haven't actually advanced their career, right? Those artists are not, they can't fill a room of 200 people that are willing to pay for a ticket in their home city. So I think, yes. I, 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 we're gonna get into a nice little argument here. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there are examples, right? Like, for example, you know, I, look, if Universal doesn't do it, somebody else will be doing it. Right? That's not, but, but that's not the but, reason to do but, a deal. But, but getting them into the ecosystem and finding the potential of that ecosystem and making a career artist out of them is another proposition. We recently have an example. David, or D4VD, right? And I think we have Band Lab and everybody. Right, but he came that. out of the Band Lab and, system. And, and, and it was, trust me, it was a little stress for me working David because the label really wanted to make him into a global superstar. You know, and that's a testament to Interscope, you know, dark room, to really make that happen. And, and he's gonna come and tour in November, you know. A year ago, he had a viral hit, mm -hmm. you know. Now, he has three, four songs in the, in the charts, in the region, and we have built a career of artists. You know, I hope it will be a long career because we are committed to invest in artists like David. There are many, which I agree with you, because of the way the world is working right now, and there's nothing I can do to change the power of uh, virality, you know? Once upon a time, there was Tazen Boy, just in case if you didn't know that, during my 80s years, right? So, but now, you know, you have people like David that could be the next big global superstar because the talent is there, you know? So I think there is a part where you say, company can't overlook the commercial uh, potential of viral, viral hits, or back in the days it's called one hit wonder, but you also have to look at the potential of bringing one of these, hopefully, one-hit wonders into a career artist proposition, which then you can represent them in a, in a nice way and build a wonderful career for these people. So that's how I like to see it. Okay, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, so um, I know that this conversation can go on for another hour. So <laughs> you can go um, to the side and we can continue that with Ed, Kelvin, and Megan. So thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you guys for joining us today.